This video is sponsored by AlphaDraft, who fill my pockets, my hefty squirrel pockets, with six grilla, mad money, lovely loot to explain to you about a service they offer for fantasy esports from multiple esports games, but they do CSGO. And they have the FASIC League up there. They have ESL, ESEA. So if you want to play, you want to make a team, enter different competitions, depending on how much money you want to spend, how much you want to try and win, there's a great service. I've used it many times myself. got wrecked many times, won sometimes. It's in the link description below. If you want to support them, thanks for the cash. So the legendary Brazilian Counter-Strike 1.6 player, Kogu, easily the best Brazilian player of all time and one of the best players of all time from any country in 1.6, would make my top 10, certainly is a player who many times over the years has teased us that he's going to come back. And particularly in CSGO, a number of times he said he's going to make a return, he's coming back, he started to practice again. And there was one such teaser a couple of weeks ago. But in line with the past kind of cock teasers in this sense, where it never quite come into fruition, people didn't think too much of it and they kind of waited to see what was going to happen. But now it's now been announced that he's part of a new team. He's part of a team called Game King. And he's playing with the players Bubble, Paradao, Pion and Ducker, and I've never heard of any of those players, by the way. But this gives me an opportunity to explain to you who Kogu was and his impact on the game, because he's absolutely an incredible player. And you have to realize, because he comes from Brazil, to some degree, his accomplishments can never quite match up to some of the other players who'd be in the top 10 players of all time, because they're going to have like multiple majors, and they're going to have tons of top placings at big lands. But you have to realize he came from a very underdeveloped country, a country that before he came along was never having real contention to win majors. And he was just such a prodigy, such an incredible godlike individual player that teams built around him went places and became elite tier. And at one point in time, were among the best, among the top three, top four, top five teams in the world for a number of years. And part of it's because of his talent and what he was able to do individually in the game at 1.6. So the thing to understand, first of all, is that Kogu's a player with a very long career, actually. He's someone who played like six or seven years professionally in terms of CS 1.6, with with a bit of time on and off for like sojourns into CS Source. There was a period of time where he quit and went and tried to play football. But he first appears around 2003. And he's playing for Generation X, G3X, which was the second best team for the majority of the time in the history of Brazilian Counter-Strike below MIBR, Made in Brazil, which is always the number one team. And around this point in time, MIBR were a team who'd been to many, many CPLs, but they always used to play below the top eight, and they used to have some okay games, but they didn't really understand the European meta game or the, the basic way you, you implement players tactically. And they had a certain set of players who were decent, but not that many of them were that good. And BSL had come over and trained with them a little bit during the summer of uh, 2003, and he'd kind of helped them learn a bit more about how to play the game and structure the team, and they started to get a bit better. But he was over there in G3X, the second best team, and he made it to top 12 of the CPL winter, which is the, one of the big majors at the end of that year, but that was it. And at the time, even still, no one really had noticed him that much, but mainly because the team wasn't that good, but people had started to notice that he was a good player though. And there was already started to get this word out there that there was this player who wasn't even in MIBR, but he had some talent. Now coming to 2004, and one of the key moments is they had a Latin Cup, which was a competition between like the Brazilian teams, etc. And, and I think it's like team is Peru and Chile and stuff. And G3X wins this tournament, beating MIBR. And so because of this, not long after, Koku's brought into MIBR, the best Brazilian team, the one with the most funding. Like I think one of the old players, a player who was playing at this time, it was his father that owned MIBR and was like somehow a millionaire or had a lot of access to a lot of money. It was just rich in some way. And so he was in some way funding it. Cause like I say, there wasn't a lot of sponsorship. And there wasn't an infrastructure in Brazil to necessarily support this stuff. And it was mainly in Brazil split up into people playing land cafes. And it tended to be split up based on which city you lived in, whether you lived in Sao Paulo or whether you lived in Rio de Janeiro. And as far as I know, actually I shouldn't speak out to it. I'm not sure where, where, where Kogu lived. So, once he joins MIBR, he goes to the next big major, which is CPL Summer 2004, but they actually only place top 12 again with this new team that he's a part of. And in fact, this time, kind of egg on their face, they finished behind G3X, the team that he's just left. The CPL at the end of that year, likewise, just a top 12 finish again. But here's the thing, even though he's only finishing top 12 of these tournaments, that CPL Winter 2004, for example, was where he finished just top 12, 
But already people had started to see this guy was an incredible player. This guy was really one of the best players in the whole world in terms of the individual skill level. Because I remember it was around this time that Shagwa's team, NOA, won that tournament. And he was even telling me, like, this guy's probably the best opera in the world. And, this, and Shagwa was a dedicated opera, was trying to be the best himself. Always was a very cocky player who thought himself incredible. But he's like, this guy's absolutely unreal. And I'll touch on some of that stuff later. So you come into 2005, and in 2005... Whereas he's never really had any reasonable international results at that point in time, now we start to get to the point where it's picking up a little bit. You have to realize the lineups that he's a part of at this time were mainly the old MIBR lineups. It was guys like Edison and Parva and Kiko. These, it wasn't the later lineups where he'd have a lot of his success. So he's just doing a lot of individual work, trying to hard carry, but the team itself isn't in the right place. They haven't got the right lineup and they haven't got the right situation in terms of practice necessarily entirely yet. So this year, there was a CPL tour, and so there was a gang of stops where he got to play, and oftentimes just versus Latin American teams. So there was a CPL Spain event. Oh, actually, that was it. There was an, there was an international event. So in May of that year, there was a, a CPL Europe event in Barcelona, Spain. And at this tournament, MIBR, interestingly enough, had element the Norwegian former SK Gaming, former NOA player, playing in their lineup. Like he temporarily been brought over to play in the team and he's supposed to join because he was a very, he was kind of a fickle player. So he moved from team to team to team. And this was just as late as that venture to go live in Brazil for a little while. And they make it to the top six, but they lost to NIP in a very close game. And funnily enough, this this was kind of what showed the problems of trying to bring an element in when he didn't speak Portuguese because famously one of the rounds they lost Someone on the MIBR said something along of, of like Porto, Porto, which means, I, I don't even show if it means I'm remembering this. I think that means like door in, in Portuguese. And Element had like no clue what the fuck that meant. So he didn't know that someone was telling him it was the door on like nuke. So he just got wrecked by a guy there in like a one on one. So you can see that didn't really work out. You can see the team's still trying to figure out how do we get better players to put around Kogu. So they only finished top six there. That year, they would win two two CPL events that were just within their regions. So it was only like the one or two smaller level European teams that went there. So they won CPL Brazil the same month, and they beat a team that had like, I think it was like DSN and Digital, these guys in it called SSV Lenitz. They beat them in the final there. They actually unfortunately lost the ESWC qualifier to Game Crashers, who at the time had then become the second best Brazilian team. So they didn't get to go to the ESWC, which was one of the extremely most stacked majors of all time, the one that Complexity ended up winning with Fraud. And interestingly enough, the team they lost to, Game Crashers, their best player was FNX. And next year, crucially, he would become a member of MIBR, and that's what would help set in place the lineup that would become truly great. Towards the end of the year, they had a CPL UK event where they finished top six again, had an epic overtime match to NIP, which they lost. It was like one of these crazy, like almost 50 round games. They had, like I mentioned before, they had the CPL, another CPL in their area, which was Chile. This time they beat the American United Five team in the final. CPL winter, one of the most stacked majors ever as well. They did really badly. They didn't manage to finish even in the top 16. They were upset really early by this team called Mug and Mouse, which were like local players in the Dallas area, which was absolutely shocking that would happen. And then they lost in the lower bracket big time to this Fnatic lineup, which wasn't even particularly good. It wasn't the Fnatic lineup 2006 with Forrest and Tentpole and those guys. This was a not very good one. So you can see the team was still a mess at this point in time. He was a great individual player, but this wasn't a vehicle that could take him anywhere. That's what changed in 2006. 2006 was where the pieces gradually came together and suddenly exploded into becoming not just a, a top team, a competitive team, but one of the best teams in the world. And he was already one of the best players in the world. So they had the vehicle to, to fully express his abilities and his capabilities and his skills within CSGO. So early in the year, they'd done terribly at this SHG Open line, which I think was in Denmark. They hadn't even finished top 12 there. They, they'd had like an okay result of this DigiLab tournament where they'd beaten Catch Gamer, who was BSL's top Norwegian team, who had like real in the lineup, etc. In the summer, they went to WSVG DreamHack Summer. At the time, DreamHacks weren't a big deal, but this is one of the first ones that became a reasonably big deal because it was part of WSVG, which was its own circuit throughout the year trying to compete with CPL. At this one, they finished top four. That wasn't bad, but lost to some teams that were a bit iffy when you think of beyond that time. They don't have any historical kind of... There's not much posterity to go with these teams. So coming into ESWC, a big major for that year, you're not expecting a whole lot. You know ESWC is the biggest tournament to win, but you're thinking, well, I mean, they lost to some of these teams like HUK. You know, what can I expect from them? They haven't even finished top 12 at SHG Open. They've never had a monster performance, basically, at an international tournament. It's a Brazilian team. But you know what? They win ESWC. A $52,000 first place check goes to the Brazilian team. 
You have to realize, like I said before, I was kind of describing the atmosphere. Brazil was like a joke in the early days, 2002, 2003. Then they're starting to get okay. They can maybe finish like top 16, top 12. And then they're starting to get, okay, we can have some top sell- top eight, top six in like 2004, 2005. But you get to 2006, no one's expecting them to ever be the best team in the world or to be able to win a major. And they do. They managed to beat the alternate team, which had an incredible run that year with Moon and Tixo and Capio and those guys in. And they managed to, in the final, interestingly enough, beat Fnatic, which was the Fnatic that had Temple and Forrest and DSN and Khan and Archie in, which was their first year trying to become a great team. And it was actually at the end of that year they would become a legendary team, but they were on their way. They were already having a lot of top placings. And so they beat them in the final despite actually having lost to them earlier in the tournament in a Dust 2 game in the group stage. So it was a very interesting tournament. It was one of the most wide open majors and they won it. And so suddenly, in a, ver- in a, in a world that was very wide open, as Nip was trying to acknowledge themselves as the best team of the year, suddenly they were making their own claim, MIBR were. Then, here's the problem. Not that long after ESWC, winning the World Championship title, essentially, he quits and goes to Qatar in the Middle East to play try to play for professional football. This is his dream. I mean, he's Brazilian. That's like, that is the number one, that's the national sport there. Every Brazilian boy in theory dreams of being a professional footballer if they can. He goes there, he tries to play. I think it was like after July or so. And it doesn't work out. I think he had some sort of injury. And so a couple of months later, he actually comes back to 1.6. So he's had a couple of months off. He's been living in Qatar. He obviously hasn't been playing CS and he comes back. You're going to think, right, he's going to be dog shit, right? No, no, no. When he comes back, he joins up with a team that was almost... In fact, I think initially it was the same lineup that he'd had that he'd won the SWC with. And one of the tournaments that they went to early on was WCG Pan America, which was a WCG tournament only for teams within the, um, the Americas. And at this tournament, they won it and they beat 3D in the final. 3D, which actually, um, let me think. I think from what I remember, this was like 3D that was like borrowing fraud or something crazy like that for just for the one tournament. But anyway, they won this tournament and... Then, but then they had a tournament back in Brazil, which was CPL Brazil, which was only a Brazilian tournament though. And here they lost to G3X, which is the second best team. They went to Dream Act Winter at the end of the year. They only finished top six. They got wrecked by NAP, who was the, ended up being the team of the year and had Zet at the time, who was probably the best player in the world. Went to CPL Winter at the very end of the year, an extremely stacked tournament, but this time only managed to finish like top 16. But in, along the way, did have a nice upset where they beat that same NIP team would be the team of the year in the group stage, made sure they couldn't go on and win the tournament. 2007. Now, this is a year where there's a whole bunch of really nice placings from Kogu. And as an individual player, he's still at his peak and he's still absolutely amazing. In fact, 2007, even though he won the ASWC in 2006, 2007 might be in his best year when he was at the most dominant. So we had this tournament, SHG Open again, the one that last year they hadn't even finished top 12 at. They go to this, MIBR, and they win the whole tournament. Even though they'd lost to NOA in the final, uh, in the upper bracket at some point, and this was the NOA that was actually the Danes, not to be confused with the former ones that was like Norwegians or Norwegians and North Americans. This was the Danish one that was like Ave, Zonic, those guys. They lost to them in the upper bracket, but they came back through the lower bracket, beat them, and then in the final, they beat Pentagram twice to win the title. And this time in time, Pentagram had already become an elite level team. Neo, Taz, those guys. And they'd already won the WCG the last year and they'd won WSVG UK. So this was a big time result. It showed you like, right, MIBR's back, Kogu's back, and they've got a chance to win tournaments again. It's not just now going to be good and getting back in the game. Now they're going to be really good again. So ESWC comes on for that year. They're the defending champs. They only have one change. They have Bit in the lineup, I think instead of Kiku. I'm not entirely sure on that. I think it was instead of Kiku. They had Bit, who now became the in-game leader, and they had this very weird style where they're extremely slow and they'd always attack on 30 seconds, but they still were a very good team. And so what happens was they managed to beat Alternate in the in the round of eight. They get to in like a close three-map series. They get to the semifinals. Oh, they've got a chance now. But they play NOA, the team that they'd beaten earlier in the year, the Danes, in the semifinal. And they play them and they lose zero to two, but in an incredibly close series, like really, really awesome series that they could have won, but they didn't. And this other team bested them and went forwards. And that team obviously would later become MTW, would become one of the best teams of all time when they added, I mean, they just got Sunder, that was one of the key elements. And obviously later they'd add Wimp and become one of the best teams ever. Now then, in the third place decider, they played Fnatic, which was Forrest in absolute god mode, and they lost this, this series. But right after the tournament, a couple of weeks later, there was a Game Goon tournament in, I think it was usually held in Bilbao, from what I remember in um, Spain, and this tournament was extremely stacked, despite the fact it didn't have the stature or prestige of a big tournament, it was really stacked. 
And at this tournament, they, you saw again what these guys were capable of because Pentagram came there, the reigning champions of that last ESWC, that was weeks before, and two-time ESWC champs. Well, one-time ESWC champ. I don't know why I said that. It was, it was the second one they won. Obviously, Brazil, obviously, MIBR were the ESWC champs. So they played them quite early on and smashed them 16-2 on Nuke, which is a good map for Pentagram. Then in the upper bracket, they'd beat Emulate. In the final, unfortunately, they would lose twice to Fnatic, who basically, from that tournament on, established themselves as the best team of the year and won tons of tournaments, were incredibly good. Forrest was in God mode, and the team is incredibly consistent, really good team played sign up. So even though they'd done very well, they couldn't win this tournament. They went to the Weggy Stars in Korea. They did okay. They had like a not very good result at a Russian tournament. And then, unfortunately, they didn't qualify for the World Cyber Games. They actually lost to... I mean, they had a kind of a mixed lineup at the time. They changed, they changed a player. They brought in Chucky. And they lost, unfortunately, to G3X, who FNX had gone back and joined. Who, I mean, he'd been in Game Crashes and denied in the SWC spot in 2005. Now, in 2007, he's in G3X for WCG because the problem with FNX was he was kind of an element himself, as in he was kind of a fickle guy who'd get no arguments with people. And even though he was quite a talented rifler and he was clearly the second-best player in MIBR, keeping them in the same team was going to be difficult throughout time because of this contentious relationship he had because he was such a young guy. And I think he'd even been removed for something weird, like missing flights on purpose or something around the Weg East Stars tournament. Since that's when they'd had to use BSL as a stand-in, actually, even though he's a Norwegian, just he knew the organization for a long time before, and he was there for commentary, and that's why they hadn't done very well. So they failed to qualify as WCG, and actually at this point in time, Kogu and the rest of his team leave CS 1.6 and go to CS Source because at the time, CGS is around, and CGS is a Source League that's on American TV, I think it was on Direct TV, and it's a tournament which had expanded beyond just North America to the other regions of the world. So they'd had a Brazilian franchise, which is called Rio Sinestro, and basically the MIBR lineup became that team. And so they went to the CGS World Finals, but they didn't do very well, actually. I mean, as an individual team, the, this lineup was good. Like, I think they made the final of the individual tournament. Like, they had a tournament for franchises where you played all the games against each other, but they had also small tournaments that were just for each game. And I think in the Source tournament, they actually made it to the final and lost to... Complexity, which had fraud and Zet and those guys on. So I think they were okay as an individual team, but the, the franchise wasn't very good, understandably so, because you had to play fighting games. And, all this, and the, it's not that the CS players played that. You had other game, people playing that. But the whole the whole concept was it didn't matter how well you did in your individual game. The others in your franchise had to do well enough for the franchise to win the match to progress in the tournament. So in 2008, they actually return to 1.6. It was around April. They're back to the lineup. And they have initially the lineup of players who played in 2007 with them. Then... They did a weird, only something like a month later, they did a, sp a swap back to Source because CGS was still sort of going on. But then they returned again four months later. CGS goes to shit. And now they're back in 1.6. Slightly different lineup, but mo most of the same players. And uh, again, remember, he's been off in Source. He's been off playing other stuff. But again, Kogu's able to come back. And maybe I was able to come back. And he's been able to, able to become a, a potent player again. Not maybe as peak, but still a very good player. And so they go to the IEM3 Los Angeles Global Challenge Tournament in October of 2008, and already they're causing upsets again. They beat Smash SK Gaming. We're talking about Valet, Tentpole, at this time at Zet actually, although Zet would dropped off and only just come back from Source himself. One of the best teams in the world, they beat them big time early in the tournament. In the upper bracket final, amazingly, they're facing the American Evil Geniuses team, which you think, well, how are they facing them? Because Evil Geniuses had actually upset Fnatic earlier in the tournament on train, where famously Nothing had had probably the one truly great game of his cs one 6 career, where he'd wrecked them on CT side of train. So they get to play EG in the upper bracket final. Now, the problem is, yeah, EG wrecked Fnatic on train. Wow, amazing. Now, MIBR gorilla stomp EG in this match, though, and get to the final. In the final, though... SK Gaming's able to come from the lower bracket and SK just beats them on the two maps. It was a single map, double LM tournament, beats them on the two maps to take the title from them so they just finished second again. But you're seeing already a top international placing. Now, the same month, there was another IEM tournament. It was in Montreal. Mainly the same teams attended. At this one, again, a crazy upset. On train, they play Fnatic early in the early in the tournament. Remember, this is the Fnatic with all those godlike players. Well, with godlike, a couple of godlike players and the players from 2007, 2008. One of the most consistent, and in 2007, the best team of the year. This is 2008 now, where they were still like a top five team, but not quite on the level of some of the others. Or just, just slightly off to not win big tournaments. They smashed them early, on train in the tournament. But then they lose them in the lower bracket and so they go out, I think, third this time. And it was Fnatic, SK, and then MIPR at this tournament. 
There was, an, there was another IEM tournament the same month. This is how crazy things were back in 2008. There was three IEM tournaments in one month and two of them in North America and the one was in fucking Dubai. They went to that one, but they only finished top six there. Nothing to write home about. Then at the end, the end of the year, there was an IEM tournament, which was IEM America, American Championship. And the idea is it's only North American and, and South American teams can play there. And so they're only playing against the best NA teams and they beat them all and they win this tournament reasonably easy, actually. Now, going into 2009... We get all these problems happen that ruin MIPR and essentially in, indirectly lead to Koki retiring. Because what happens is, first of all, there's this thing where the team kick out Bit, who wasn't one of the best players, but he was the in-game leader and he had some interesting ideas about how to play the game. He was a team player. They kick him out the team and eventually this sets off a chain reaction where um, pretty much every other member of MIBA except Kogu leaves, goes to Fire Gamers, who now become the second best team in Brazil and now are contending for the top spot and eventually do become the best team in Brazil, mainly because the owner makes it clear to these guys that I'm going to make MIBR around Kogu and it's always going to be Kogu and four players. And you guys can be part of that, but it'll always be this way. And they don't like that. Some of these guys are very accomplished. They're not as good, but you know how these things go with politics. So they leave, make their own team. And that ends up having a big effect on the year because now Kogu has to play with a bunch of players who are like second tier or 30 or good players, but who haven't got that much experience. And the team's very much a hodgepodge of different players. who Some are who are good, some are who are unproven. And they go to like IEM Global Finals, which is one of the big majors, don't even make to the top eight. They go to Code 5. This one, they have a decent result at. They go top eight, but they lose to SK Gaming, who at the time was the second best team in the world with Tempole and those guys on. They lose to them in quite a close series where they could have won the first two maps. They did win the second one in overtime. They lost the third. So that was like a decent performance. You could still see some sparks. At the time, though, Koku was still good, but now he's like dropping off a bit. He's, he's not quite as incredible at one point. An individual player. Admittedly, most of the individual players weren't as godlike at this point in time, though some were. As, as in just the raw impact even a god could have on the game had been reduced a little bit by how the, the meta game had evolved and how teams had evolved and players had improved towards the skill cap as it were now there was a scenario where Bit rejoined the team somehow later on in the year this team didn't qualify for WCG Fire Gamers went there they went to IEM Chengdu but did very poorly there and towards the end of the year around November late November he retired actually Kogu just announced his retirement from 1.6 he's done he's gone and actually MIBR just released the whole team like a couple of days later understandably so because like I said the team was supposed to be based around him he was the star he was the talismanic player he was the prodigy of Brazil and he was now you have to understand when you're talking about the style and the strengths and the skill of Kogu like I say he is absolutely one of the most skilled players of all time I think he's the best AWPA to ever play any version of CS from what I've seen an utterly unreal player the key thing to understand is he came from the school of the traditional dedicated AWPA which is the traditional AWPA the dedicated style is that guy who uses the AWPA every round and because he's using it every round it's very expensive and you've got to use it tactically to get specific shots to hold your position you don't just go for the fastest shot what you do is you go for the shot you're sure will hit so the the, the kind of simple way to describe this is the slow and steady shot but the problem is when i say slow and steady i just mean sometimes you'll go a little bit slower to ensure you hit the shot you're not actually going extremely slow obviously and it's not that he was slow he was quite a quick player it's just that he wasn't just the lightning fast markov style because until markov no one could do that and hit with a very high hit rate the key thing was though he was just fast enough where it always looked like on his shots you never needed to go any faster because he always hit them he really probably had the best hit rate of any opera i've in, in any version of CS the best I've ever seen I've seen many many opens I've never seen ones who could just hit as consistently as him it's like he knew exactly the bounds of how quickly to fire a shot what range to fire a shot at, what angle to take a shot at. he was absolutely unreal as hit rate I remember Shagwa when he was at his peak he was at his absolute peak doing all the shit he could do he even told me the thing with Kogu was when you played against him it just felt like he'd never missed and so it would just crush you mentally because you were like I can't take peaks versus a guy. I can't hold angles versus this guy. Your team wouldn't want to run into a spot where you know he holds it because they know he's going to get the first guy. He's going to have a chance at the second guy. If the third guy isn't coming, you know, this is the sort of thing that would fuck with people's heads. As a result, people used to literally say, I mean, I remember the Finns, 69N, 28E, Lopez's former team that had some extremely skilled players on, Rui, Conte, Nasu. They used to literally say, when you played MIBR, it felt like if you killed Kogu, you won the round. If you didn't kill Kogu, you were going to lose the round. That's literally what playing MIBR became. It just became, we must kill the Kogu. That was what it was all about. Now, as a result, 
in the latter years, when some of his teammates weren't as good or fell off a bit or he had to play with lesser players, it did make him a little bit baity because he essentially, he knew this himself. He knew he was the main carry. He had to be alive. He had to get his spots. He couldn't just take a crazy angle and a super fast shot. So he was a little bit baity, but I can almost understand it because it's hard to trust when you haven't got the right teammates around you and you're having, and really, you are having to win the game. It's like that Michael Jordan quote. Yeah, there's no I in team. Yeah, but there isn't win. So if I want to win this specific game, sometimes I have to take over the game, even if the team concept would be better for the long-term growth in theory. And th another thing to note is he used the AWP 24-7 every time he could, and he was one of the best ever. In fact, he was the best ever for my money. Yet, his other weapons were really good. And not just for an AWPer, because at the time, most AWPers weren't that good with rifles. He had legitimately good rifles. Skill, really nice co silenced Colt, good AK, and his pistols were always famously good, particularly his USP. There's a bunch of highlight clips out there that people will remember, such as the Inferno clip, which wrecks people. I think it might even have been Fanatic. Uh, or maybe SK, actually, when I think about it now. Now, the problem is, tying into some of the things I've said before, his attitude was a bit stubborn. Now, understandably so, he was the, the god of his country, he was the main carry, and he was the guy, essentially, who had to do a lot of the work to get you the win, so his ideas are probably going to have a lot of weight to them and should be taken with a lot, on, on their own merits, but still trusting that he knows to a degree what he needs to do. But there was the feeling towards the end, this is why those players left, that... He was a bit stubborn in terms of like things had to be his way. And so if there was disagreements, that's what people didn't like. And then the fact that the MIBR owner sided with him because he was this player who brought him a world championship is what caused a lot of the resentment there. But you can see why that's why he was always a part of MIBR once he joined from G3X early on. With that said, one of the reasons why he was a god wasn't just his prodigious talent, which certainly was a massive factor, or what a unique player he was or how he revolutionized Orping and how, how he played the game, but he was incredibly dedicated. There are great stories, okay, where one of the things that got MIBR to be really good is they started to use their manager's money to get them boot camps in Sweden. So for huge events like an ESWC type event, they'd get the guy to fly them over for one or two weeks to stay in Sweden, go to Inferno Online, one of the best internet cafes, stay there and just practice versus European teams to get their level up and make sure they were all in form. And when they would go there, there's these stories that at, late at night, they'd close up Inferno Online. And the, the guy who owned this, this place would come to Kogu, come to MIBR, and he'd say, like, right, I'm going to lock up now. And then they'd basically just tell him, yeah, just lock us in. Be like, well, you know, I'm not coming back till like 8 a.m. Yeah, yeah. So they'd just lock them in, and Kogu would literally just play scrims, 10-mans, deathmatch, all night long. Because during these few weeks he had in Europe, he wanted to be at his max level, playing with the best players he could, getting his, his skill level to an incredibly high level. And so you add in the talent, you add in the, the will to win, you add in dedication, and he took advantage of every opportunity he had. And when you hear some of the results I had, like I said, yeah, there was down periods. Was, there weren't every tournament placing top four like some of the elite European teams. But considering where they come from and, and what such a poor country in terms of producing great esports players, this great player accomplished a lot relative to that. I mean, he did literally won a major and had many top, top two, top three placings at big international tournaments and routinely was able to provide single map upsets over some of the best teams in the world, some of the best players in the world. And they all had to acknowledge he was an incredible player. And at this time, the only player anyone even debated was as good as him with the AWP was actually Fraud, when Fraud was in his prime of 2004, 2005, 2006. Other than that, it was just all Kogu. And for my money, it, 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 overall, it's Kogu. You look how long he played, how much success he had, and how, what a great player he was. Now, the story doesn't end there. I did all the style stuff at that point because I thought that's the end of 1.6. He played in CSGO. So initially, he actually supposedly was going to come back in, I think he came back briefly in Source, actually, believe it or not, towards like 2009, 2010, where he was playing for pro gaming. And this is relevant because later on, he would play with this pro gaming team early in CSGO. So TSGO started to get really big around like August of 2012. Actually, I shouldn't say get really big. What I mean get really big is just become an esports game and have lands. It was actually an incredibly small game. It was still, in fact, it was smaller than 1.6, which still had an active scene, believe it or not, with like Na'Vi in the polls and Fnatic and existing those guys. Well, at this point, it existed just left to make it, but Fnatic was still around. So he plays with this pro gaming team, and in, I think it was November of that year, they went to two lands. They went to ESWC, which was one of the bigger tournaments, but they went out in the group stage. There was all this drama where they'd like checked in their all their equipment with their luggage and it got lost so they didn't have their equipment and then they couldn't set up properly so someone didn't have sound so it, it was a massive fuck fest it was just complete clusterfuck went to shit so they did poorly there then at dreamhack winter a couple of weeks later this one was a bit better in the group stage they were able to beat 
the Curse NA team, which was Anger and Skadoodle. And then they made it to the round of eight, but they had to play Nip there. And remember, Nip at this point in time wasn't losing any matches online, so they lost 0-2, to two, unsurprisingly. But one of the games was close. Beyond that, he played with Pain Gaming early in 2013, but it's not a lot happened there. And then, essentially, I mean, it, that was it after that. That was it from Kogu. He was off. No one knew it was going to happen again. There were these occasional, every it felt like every six to eight months, you'd hear something, oh, he might come back, he's going to come back. There'd be a picture on Facebook, there'd be a comment somewhere on a Brazilian site. And unfortunately, because he was such a legendary player and it's so important to the Brazilian scene to have these team, play, teams and players, because at the time they didn't have this luminosity team, they didn't have Keed, Stars and Kaboom until 2015 that were like a legit team that could cause upsets. Obviously, everyone hopes if Kogu comes back, let's all get on the Kogu hype train. Let's believe he's going to be really good and dedicated and he can lead us back. Now, obviously, what's interesting now is he's joined a team full of people I've never heard of who probably will never accomplish anything. And realistically, how could he ever accomplish anything if he doesn't join Luminosity? That's what it feels like, right? But why would Luminosity pick him up? They've already got some good players in their team. They've already got some AWPers. They've already got they've already got pretty much people at every position. And their main AWPer is Fallen. Now, Fallen is the player who... When they made Fire Gamers and all those players except Kogu left, eventually they got fallen and he became the, the, the Neo Kogu, as in the new Kogu. He became this really skilled, amazing AWPer who had all of Kogu's ex-teammates around him and knew how to play around an AWPer who became really sick, never had the same accomplishments as Kogu, but managed to have a lot of great performances. And as Kogu left the game, it was all about fallen from then on. So I wonder if there's even any rivalry aspect there. I've never asked fallen about that. But obviously, it would be weird to have them both in the team, especially since you, running dual op setups is really dangerous in CSGO now because how expensive it is unless you can make it work. And they've already got skill in that team now. They've got Cold, who had the, Cold Zero, had these amazing performances at Dream Occlusion of Poker. They have Fur, who's always impressed me in 2015, a really good player, despite the fact he is coming from a country not known for great players in CSGO. And now Fallen's level's gone up a bit, and suddenly they're a good team. We saw how close they were playing against Na'Vi to beating Na'Vi, and Na'Vi obviously went to, made it to the final. And obviously they beat Fnatic earlier in the tournament there. So they're, they're a good team. Problem is Kogu's are far away from that, and he's got to prove a lot before we could even imagine him joining a team like that. It seems unlikely he will. And so he's tried these comebacks before. They have never happened or didn't work. He is one of the greatest players of all time. Maybe not in CSGO, but I would definitely be interested if he really does come back. If he really does play tournaments, and if he ever gets to international tournaments, it would at least be a curiosity to watch him play because he was a truly great player. Thanks for the cash, Alpha Draft.